Back to the Future, you all seen the movie, right? This isn't that. Just wanted, it was kind of a fancy title. But it does have an element. In fact, you know, it's interesting. Do any of you like time travel movies? Yeah, it's kind of, they kind of play with your mind a little bit, don't they? The Bible has got lots of time travel in it. There's all kinds of things happening in the spiritual realm. John went in forward into time, as did Daniel. And then sometimes they go back in time. So it's kind of an interesting little thing here. So putting this whole thing together today, I'll tell you what, if for any of you that have done sermons, you know that um, you start the week or two weeks, whatever it is you're working on it, and you're going down a certain path, and all of a sudden you hit the wall, and all of a sudden you realize that's not really what I want to do. And maybe it was just a little bit of a moment where the Lord just said, I want to steer you in this direction a little bit. So we went in a different direction in the last couple of days. And I suddenly realized that we have something that's very important for us to understand. And I'm going to get to that in just a second here, our opening thoughts. In this portion, I'm going to divide it up into two parts. We're going to do 9, 24, and 25 today. And next week, we're going to do 26 and 27. Gabriel, the angel, continues his explanation and his prophecy, in a sense, of the most critical time in Israel's future, which is going to include Israel or Messiah's first appearance and a preview of his second appearance. We have a look into the future well over 500 years from Daniel's perspective. The passage explains Messiah Yeshua's mission and includes three time divisions that are leading to both his first and his second comings. His time and how it's counted, we're going to get a little bit into that. I don't want to spend too much time. By the way, Chris is publishing these slides. So several of the slides have lots of detail, which I'm not going to cover in that much depth. I'll get, I will cover the highlights, but you'll be able to go on to the website and download these slides for further uh, for detail for you. So uh, Jack had asked me a couple weeks ago, are you going to write any notes out? Because there's so much stuff going on here. So Jack, yes, there are notes and they're in the slides. And if you have any questions, um, come see me afterwards. Okay. Last but not least, there is an element to this passage tied very deeply, and this was the aha moment I had yesterday, tied very deeply to hope and forgiveness. Hope and forgiveness. These seem to be the, the underlying themes that Daniel is living with. He is in the midst of a very sinful Israel. In fact, if you remember the first 20 verses of, the, of chapter 9, it was his prayer asking for God's forgiveness for Israel's sin. And what's interesting is Daniel did not live in Israel much. He was only there maybe 13 or 14 years. He didn't go through the sinful times of the kings and all the other things that had happened over the years. Daniel was a relatively young boy when he was transported to Babylon. And so he's confessing the sins of his people from the past and the history, hundreds and hundreds of years. But Daniel, while he is talking about sin and forgiveness, he also gives us in his writings the idea of hope. Because somewhere between forgiveness and hope is the Messiah. We are here because we have hope for the future. We are here because we are sinners, asking for a, to a just and loving God to forgive us for our sins, which leads me very simply, to a simple statement of the gospel, that Yeshua the Messiah, who is featured in these verses, not by name, but certainly by description, took our sins, your sins and mine, to the cross, where he bore all of that, the beatings and the torture and all of that from the Romans. And he died for us, was buried, and then resurrected the third day, because he loved us. So somewhere in there, there is hope for the forgiveness of our sins, and there is forgiveness for, from us, which gives us hope. And that really, if you think about it, the entire Bible can be summarized with the idea that we have something to look forward to. 
And that, to me, really hit me hard. Despite all the detail of the numbers and all the, the, the dates and all that stuff, it's great stuff and interesting. But underneath all of that is God's love. And that's what we have to continue to focus on. So let's take a look at a little timeline review here. These are the chapters of Daniel, and we are here in the 70 weeks vision. He did this about five, the, the Lord visited him about 539 BC, roughly. And we know that even though uh, he's writing here, he's early years of the Persian uh, dynasty when, he, uh, when Babylon had been taken by the Persians. So that kind of gives us a little timeline, gives us an idea where we're at. Now, all of that, did Yeshua, and this is where Chuck Missler, you guys know who Chuck Missler is, right? Chuck Missler lives in my head sometimes. He's been gone a few years, but if you've ever followed, yes, he passed away a few years ago. I had a chance to meet him a number of years ago, and it was a, he was as humble then as he was when I met him like 40 years ago. Incredible man. And he would always say that the, the children of Israel should have expected Yeshua's visit. They should have known he was coming. And that's what the 70 weeks prophecy is really all about. Because if they were paying attention to the prophecy, and I'm going to work some of that out today for you, not everything, but as much as I can, you will see that there was an expected time of his arrival. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at some of this as we get started. This was a, one of the ads that I did late in the preparation process. In Luke 19, 41 and 42, when he approached Jerusalem, the day of his uh, triumphal entry, he saw the city and he wept over it. So if anybody's wondering if Yeshua is, is man and God together, and I can't really understand all of that, he had human emotions. We have to remember that he had human emotions. We have that in common. And I don't know when we meet him if we're not going to be just on our face crying. And just be glad to be there. I will be happy to be a janitor in heaven. That will be okay. A little shack on the side of the road, much better place to be. Saying, if you had known on this day, even you, the conditions for peace. Was there an expectation on his part that we should have known or they should have known that he was coming? Seems pretty clear to me but now they have been hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will put up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And we know what happened later in the first century when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans and the Jewish believers took this seriously and they headed out of the hills. They got out of town. They will level you to the ground and throw down the children with you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, speaking of the temple, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Precise. And an expectation. An expectation. As I mentioned before, Missler had brought this up a lot, and I think to myself, are we living with that expectation ourselves? Let's look a little further in John 7, 8. Go up to the feast on your own. I am not going up to the feast because my time is not yet come. He was signaling in several places. I just picked up a couple of these for reference here today, John 7, 30. So they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. He wasn't ready. The days of the Daniel 70, prophet, nine, chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, the 70 weeks prophecy, was ticking down, but it wasn't quite there. There was a clock that Yeshua was following, an expectation. But I tell you what, the scripture is precise. It's going to tell you what to think and what to do. We have the Torah, we have the prophets, and we have the writings to guide us in daily living. 
This seems to indicate that there would be a specific day of his arrival. Now, to the students or the aficionados of the Jewish calendar, and several of you have taken the Jewish calendar apart, it will drive you out of your mind. Because the detail is so incredible. What is it, every eight years, another month is added, the second of Adar, I think it is. There's a, and you can, trust me, all of, the, of the, uh, the writers on this, all the scholars, everybody's got a different path to getting to the answers. And as we, as we learn, this writer will say this and this writer will say that, and you go, well, where's the truth in all this? Right? Go back to the scripture and you do the best you can to put it all together. The, some of the debates here deal with the, the full moons and the lost days on the calendar. There's even something called the intercalary process which is the time where you would add, in fact, the Greeks and the Jews would add an extra month every several years. I wanted to set up the rest of this today with the idea, number one, there was the, there would be a specific day Yeshua would come and that he would signal in advance to all of us that are busy reading our Bible in several places that he wasn't gonna go and accept this particular time and position that he was appointed to until the time was up. So what does that fulfillment actually look like? Well, let's take a look here. We're going to take in this lead up here, we're going to look at language because language sometimes brings us joy and sometimes it'll drive us nuts. But there is some joy here. We're going to have a little fun. Okay, you guys ready for a little fun? All right, so let's have a little fun today, right? This is working toward a biblical language construct called biblical weeks. Right. There's a blank there. You're all thinking, where is, it? where is it going with this? A blank of lions. A blank of geese. How about this one? A blank of baboons. You guys ready? A pride of lions, as the language goes, right? A gaggle of geese. Here's my favorite. See, people have been bugging me to drop humor into the, and tell jokes. What can I tell you? Right? How many of you agree with this? Yeah, there you go. All right. <laughs> I love it. Okay, let's go to the next one. Century. What is a century? A hundred years, right? We know that. We can use a word to express a concept, right? We can use a word to express a concept. Bible does a lot of that. We're going to be looking at that today. A decade is, of course, 10 years. How about a fortnight? Anybody know what a fortnight is? Two weeks, 20 days. I've heard different words. Yeah, you get the idea. A dozen. Well, of something, right? Or 13, if you're a baker's dozen, right? Jacob had a dozen sons. Let's have a little fun with this now. By the way, it could be like a dozen eggs. It could be a dozen roses. Eggs are interesting. I thought, you know what? I'm going to play with eggs a little bit today. Let's do this. So what has that got to do with the price of eggs? This is a picture from the gold rush, 1849, the gold rush. Those are eggs all piled up because somebody figured out in the gold rush, you didn't need to go mining for gold to make money. The smart ones were selling things to the miners, and that's how they made money in the gold rush. Is anybody here wearing Levi's today? Levi Strauss, I don't know how much money he made, but he started selling his jeans during the gold rush. Interesting story. Nice Jewish guy from Europe figures out, you know what? I got a business opportunity here, and I'm going to take advantage of it. These eggs, by the way, were gathered. They were not chicken eggs. They were gathered on an off, an island off the, um, in San Francisco, but off the uh, mainland by this group of birds that just produce all these amazing eggs. And this is how the miners lived. So let's take a look at what this meant to them. This guy, um, Edward Gould Buffum, uh, the author of Six Months in the Gold Mines, 1850, described having a breakfast of bread, cheese, butter, sardines, and two bottles of beer 
with a friend in receiving a bill for $43 in 1849. Oh, it gets better. That is the equivalent today of 1200 bucks for breakfast. If you're complaining about $5 eggs at the store, the poor gold miners were having the same problem. There were reports of canteens charging a dollar for a slice of bread or two if it was buttered, the equivalent of $56 today. Imagine going to Jersey Mike's. A dozen eggs might cost you $90 at today's prices. A pickaxe, of course, you needed a pickaxe to go into the, into the mines, right? That would cost you about $1,500 in today's dollars. And a pound of coffee in today's dollars, $1,200. My advice, grind your own. A pair of boots, three grand. Mr. Mr. Strauss, there was, I looked up, I went all over the place trying to find how much jeans cost, no reference. Couldn't find it. Thank you for that, all right. Grant's all over it. 90 bucks for a dozen eggs, $56 for two slices of bread, 1,500 bucks for a pickaxe, and there's your coffee and your pair of boots, today's prices. So just a little context, because we love our context, don't we? Smithsonian Magazine is the source there, so if you want to go look at that, you can find it on the web. 70 weeks or 77s. Now, all due respect to our Hebrew experts here, Shavuim Shivim. Shavuim Shivim. I'm getting a head nod from Chuck. I'm good to go. We would expect the word weeks to be Shavuot, would we not? Okay. There's something different in this phrase. There's something different in this phrase that's giving us, the readers, a signal that this particular prophecy is going to have a different context to it. Now, math, math, counting things. You guys know who he is, right? Or at least you think you know who he is. Not everything that counts can be counted. And not everything that can be counted counts. You think you know who said this. <laughs> the pictures are similar, all due respect. But if you think about that for a second, we have lots of things in our lives that we can count, but does everything really matter? Does it count? Let's take a look at what the scripture tells us. So Daniel 9.24, Gabriel is giving the prophecy to Daniel. And by the way, it is very possible here. I think the context seems to indicate that this is a face-to-face. -face. It's not a vision. It's not a, some kind of an ethereal concept here. Gabriel was face-to-face -face with Daniel. Now, I pulled two different translations here. One, the New American Standard, and another one, which I'll get to in just a second. In virtually every English translation, and I looked at like 20 of them, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people. And that's the way it reads, 70 weeks all over the place. You've heard this, you've read it. 70 weeks decreed for your people. And your holy city, which of course is Jerusalem, to finish the wrongdoing, there are six things here. And this is where the focus of the sermon took me. I was all into the calculating the weeks and the days and the leap years and all this kind of stuff. And then suddenly, like my mother used to do, a little smack on the back of the head, and she was really good at that. I want you here, not there. There are six things that this entire passage brings to us that is critical for our understanding of what's underneath the text. There are six things to finish the wrongdoing. And th these are in different uh, translations are going to sound a little different. To make an end of sin, two. To make atonement for guilt, three. Three negative things at the beginning. 
to bring in everlasting righteousness, which is a good thing, right? There's three positives and three negatives here. To seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. That's how the New American Standard Translation looks. Let's look at another translation. This is from the new NLT, the New Living Translation. A period of 70 sets of seven. See the difference? 70 sets of seven, a much more accurate portrayal of the Hebrew in the NLT. 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish their rebellion. Interesting that the replacement, instead of transgression, it says rebellion. To put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, bring everlasting righteousness, confirm the prophetic vision, and anoint the most holy place. Some slightly different words there. I'm learning Hebrew. I'm still not where I'd like to be. But I've learned, if you break it down, you can start getting some some patterns here. And so we're going to look at some of this. this. This word from Gabriel instructs Daniel that a 70 week period is going to be decreed for the people. And these six items, broken up into two parts, are going to be the focus of what we're talking about today. Although I will visit some of the math. And since the slides are put together so that I just got a lot of notes in there, I may not concentrate a lot on some of the slides, but I, they're there for your use. So if you want to download them, you can do the review on your own. All right, so let's go back now to the, there's our text. So, Shavuim Shavim is the key Hebrew place here. So the term 77s doesn't exactly translate to 70 weeks and vice versa. Embedded here are six items, as I mentioned. Just as we're not looking at 70 weeks, which Daniel, from Daniel's perspective, he's reading Jeremiah. Remember, he looked at the 70-year prophecy. He may have been thinking, in fact, a lot of the scholars had alluded to this, that he was thinking, hey, in just another couple of years, Messiah's coming and it's over. So Gabriel was kind of level setting him a little bit. He was changing his perception. No, it's not going to be just a few weeks. It's going to be about 490 years, I should say exactly 490 years in the overall prophecy. So that takes Daniel's perception of something that's going to be fulfilled possibly in his lifetime, and it now puts it out way into the future. So that leaves us thinking, what does 490 mean? Because 70 times 7 is 490. So let's dig into this a little bit. This is Messiah's mission. The concept of weeks. Where does that concept come from? Where do you get seven making up a seven-year period of time? Well, in Genesis chapter 29, verses 27 and 28, we remember our old friend Jacob. Complete the week of this one, he's told by Laban, his father-in-law, and we will give you the other also. Remember? He had bargained to work for a designated period of time, seven years. He was going to get Rachel. He fell in love with Rachel. And what did Laban do? At the last minute, he slips in Leah. And he ends up waking up the next morning and he's surprised. Or so the scripture seems to indicate that. So Laban tells him, look, you want Rachel? No problem. You can have her too. You just got to work seven more years. Jacob did so and completed her week. And he gave him his daughter, Rachel, as his wife. So now Jacob doesn't have one wife. He's got two. I'm not going to get into that discussion. That is a whole other kettle of fish. There's some, a week in Hebrew then, based on context, can mean seven years. It can mean seven years. Make sense so far, right? Yeah. Makes sense. Now, the Jewish Publication Society, the 1917 translation, gives us this, uh, this translation, and I thought this was right on the money. Wait until the bridal week of this one is over, and we'll give you that one too, provided you serve me for another seven years. Same context here, but he uses, the, the, the Jewish translators use the term bridal week. I thought that was really powerful, because this sets up the concept of the Jewish wedding, which is a fascinating study. We're going to do one of those sometime in the future. The concept of weeks can then and is used as a, what is known as a heptad of seven time periods, often used as a period of seven years, and that is the scriptural basis or where the concept of a week comes from, a week meaning seven years. And this is where one of our concepts today, one of our main ideas today comes from. What did Jacob have as he's working for Rachel? 
he has hope. He has hope for this absolutely stunning, beautiful woman who somehow or another has really captivated his attention. You know, we can't live without hope. Hope, hope is what we live for. We don't have hope. What's the point? So it's one of the key words here, hope. And the second one, of course, is forgiveness. From Genesis 29, 30, and Laban gave his female slave Bilhah to his, uh, uh, to his daughter Rachel as her slave. And Jacob had relations with Rachel also. And he indeed loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban another seven years. So there is the concept of the biblical week. Very deep. But right there on the surface, if you dig it, dig up um, the, the details here in the Torah. The Torah is going to give us that foundation. Let's look at the heartbeat of Daniel 9.24. Now, I'm digging up all this stuff, and I'm, I'm, it, it was, there was so much detail here. How do I get to the central truth? How do I get to that kernel of information that's going to mean something to people? These are the first three items on the list in 924. To finish the, trans, uh, the rebellion, and I believe that's a better word for it, to put an end to their sin and to atone for their guilt. These are the things that Yeshua did the first time he was here. So 924 gives us in view Yeshua's first appearance. And these are the things that he's going to accomplish. These are broken out, but I said in two, two sets of three. And there's some matching you can do. You can actually align the first one with the fourth one, the second one with the fifth one, and the third one with the sixth one. So item number one, let's, do, let's dig into that a little bit. To finish the rebellion, Restra which means in the Hebrew, restrain firmly or completely. It has the sense of removing the sin completely from God's sight. So it deals with our rebellion, and in specific, the NLT captures the angle here is the rebellion, a sense that although the transgression or sin, the sin fits the context, the rebellion has to be finished. And what is that rebellion? It is rejection of the Messiah. Israel had an opportunity when Yeshua first came. And the leadership, certainly, not all the people, but the leadership rejected his mission. And that appears to be, based on all the reading I did this last couple weeks, the primary part of the transgression or the rebellion. The sin has to come under control so that it can no longer flourish, specifically Israel's rejection of her Messiah. This will end Israel's national transgression or rebellion. That was what Yeshua initially came to. Remember he said, I came to the first, uh, first to the house of Israel. So he's here for a reason. The second item, make an end to sins, has the sense in the Hebrew of securely locking it away like in a prison. This has to do with sin relating to missing the mark or being sealed up and put away. This ends sin in both daily living as well as the national rebellion. So it captures all sin and cleanses Israel. Yeshua's mission. The third one, to atone for their guilt, or make an atonement. We all know what the word atonement is. We observe it every year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It has to do with atoning or expiating sin. Although the key objective here is ending the rebellion against God's anointed, there is also an element of forgiveness of daily sin. And there comes in our second theme. Hope and forgiveness. Hope and forgiveness. When you're forgiven of something, does that reestablish your hope? Releasing you from that? That's what this is about. So each speaks the future hope. Let's look at the second set. There's some specific some notes here you can do further research in Isaiah 53 and Zechariah 12. And Zechariah 12, of course, is the Recognition by Israel of recognizing her Messiah and repenting. There's the second set, item four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. This ushers in the age of Messiah, the Messianic kingdom, and the millennium. 
And of course, Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48, get into the Millennial Temple, and all of that is worked out. This establishes the kingdom, and as mentioned before, Daniel may have thought that the kingdom was imminent, but it was not. So Gabriel is telling him there's going to be another 483 years, and we'll get into that in just a minute, until Messiah comes. Then after a gap of untold years, right now we're waiting, we're in suspension, in about 2,000 years, the final seven years of the prophecy, or Daniel's 70th week, a total of 490 years, will be eventually accomplished. But we're going to talk about the first 69 weeks in just a couple minutes. Item 5 confirms the prophetic vision, sealing up the vision and prophecy, causes cessation, and fulfills completely. This is, can also be translated to cause a cessation of prophecy, meaning both the oral and written prophecy, whatever is spoken out loud and whatever was written according to this. This is a, because a program of 77s will contain the final fulfillment of everything and will be completely accomplished by the second coming of Messiah. So we have five items so far. The first three are negative, the second three are positive. The last part of this is anointing the holy place, which has to do with the Holy of Holies in the Millennial Temple. So we have here the anointing of the holy place. Each speaks to the future, and each speaks to hope. Let's look at Daniel 9.25. There's some further references there. Daniel 9.25. So, Daniel, Gabriel tells him, we have a time frame here you've got to understand. And when you understand the time frame, a lot of this is going to make a lot more sense. So you are to know and understand. Remember that word know is yada, which means to know in Hebrew. And understand, sechal. My mother used to say sechal in the Yiddish. It was the common sense. It was like, use your sechal. He would say, think about what's going on here. Look, at, look underneath the surface. Find out and learn what the intent is behind whatever you're looking at. That's where the understanding comes in, the wisdom we might call it. So you are now to understand, know and understand that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. 7 plus 62, to our math wizards here, is 69 weeks. It will be built again with streets and moat, even in times of distress. And oh my God, do the scholars have a great time with this. Everybody's got a different beginning period and an ending period. But the only one that fits is the one that ends up at the 70th or the 69th week with Messiah entering Jerusalem. There's a lot of detail here, a lot. The key here is the issuing of a particular decree by the king, which will send the returning Jews a very precise message. It's not the temple this time, this is the city of Jerusalem. It includes the street and the moat, which would include, of course, the walls and all these other things. Not specifically um, the holy places. So those are also in view because uh, they were already being worked on. This was to take place before the Messiah would come. Debates on which specific decree will drive you nuts. There's so much detail here, but the one that seems to fit best is Cyrus's decree to Nehemiah, captured in Nehemiah 2, which we're going to look at in just a couple of minutes here. The timing is laid out for the entire time frame, less the final week. So we're going to look at the 69, the 7 plus 62, totaling 69 here to begin with. That's going to be our focus in the next few minutes. Uh, the beginning... This is what the, I'm, going to, I'm going to throw a little technical term. The beginning here is called the terminus ad quo, and the end time is called the terminus ad quem. The end point, the beginning, and the end, those two Latin phrases are used to apply here. So there is the basic calculation. 7 plus 62 equals 69. So this is a timeline. I wanted to put together a graphic here, and there's several. I'm just going to run through these um, in, a, in a couple minutes that are a little bit more detailed, but I'm not going to spend that much time on them. But this gives you an idea. The first seven weeks of 49 years would count up to something like 17,640 days. As we're at, we have a 30-day prophetic year, and we'll talk about where that comes from in a minute. And then the 62 weeks is going to count up to 156,240 days. 
Now, there are different ways at this, and I will be the first one to admit this is not my strength. If you are an aficionado of the Jewish calendar and you love math and accounting, come see me, engineers included. But it's a fascinating thing because Daniel is given a specific period of time broken out into Jewish understanding. That's why we're here, right, to look at this Hebraic perspective in the scripture that is going to give us a total number of years and then multiplied out by days. Let's look at this a little bit further. There's Bible math. There's some assumptions that we can go on. A 360 day lunar day, uh, a lunar day years, I should call it. And I have uh, some information on that in just a minute. Two time divisions, seven weeks and 62 weeks. If you take the seven weeks, multiply it by seven, you get a total of 49 years based on our Genesis calculation earlier. That was to rebuild the city and the moat and the walls and all of that. The next period of time is 62 weeks. Multiply that by seven, you get the total of 434 years to Messiah the Prince, which comes in Daniel 9.25. The detail here is stunning. It is absolutely stunning. The decree, we are talking about that a couple of weeks ago. Which decree? There's a million of them. Maybe not a million, a few. The decree had to do with rebuilding Jerusalem. That was the key. Because Jerusalem, you might remember, was utterly destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. So the holy city was completely taken down, as was the temple. Daniel, he's, as he's praying, he remembers all this from his childhood. So after all the dust settles, we end up with this. Seven plus 62 is 69 weeks of years, or 49 plus 434 equals 483, what are known as prophetic years. And again, these are all in the slides. You can download these when you want. After Chris up, um, puts them out on the internet, and you can go ahead and uh, use them as you need to. After all the dust settles, there's a simple way to calculate the math, and it's being used, it's being done through the lunar year cycles. Some of my sources, I just want you to know where I went with this. Sir Robert Anderson, the, who wrote The Coming Prince, back, by the way, he was a Scotland Yard detective who decided to put his investigative skills together, and he wrote a book about this particular chapter. It's fascinating. Another source I used was something uh, by a guy named J. Paul Tanner, who wrote something called Daniel. He's got a number of other books he's written. John Wolverd in Daniel as well. And the Moody Bible Commentary, as well as the Moody Handbook of Messianic Prophecy. So I dug into these different sources and I tried to boil all of it down to just a couple of simple slides. The data is available for you. But again, let's keep in mind here what this is really all about. Two words, hope and forgiveness. Because Israel is going to be needing to be forgiven by Messiah. And once the people are forgiven, they get hope. If we don't have hope, we have nothing. So in a nutshell, there's the calculation. In this 483 weeks of years times 360 days per year, the prophetic lunar cycle gives us that number, 173,880 days until Mashiach Nagid, which is the term in the Hebrew, in Daniel 9. And there's another there's another prince that comes here as well. We're going to get into him next week. He's not the Messiah. Now let's look, look at a little more detail here. These, these are the, the reference slides that I put in for you. These come from Sir Robert Anderson's book, The Coming Prince, and John Walvoord's book, The Daniel Commentary. That was how it looks for it. Again, I just put for reference only there. We've already gone through the data, but that's the detail you can see worked out in a mathematics uh, equation. Let's look at the next one. Now, this is taken from including the, day, the, leap, uh, the leap years, 115 leap years, plus there's a 25 day interim there uh, from Nisan the first to Nisan the 10th, 444 BC to uh, 33 AD. And it, this gets into way too much detail, but I wanted to show you this was one of the charts that was included in Anderson and Walvoord's books. So this data is out there for you. I, I'm including it in the slides, I'm not really talking to this too much here, but it's available for you and you'll be able to go out and do your own research. Now, 
30, where do we get a 30 day month? Where does that come from? Well, something hit me this week. Another, another, I felt like I got hit by a bus yesterday. It's what it felt like. I kept getting these numbers, right? 30 days in a month. And, and suddenly I looked at all these different sources. The number 1260 comes up and the number three and a half or the, the phrase three and a half years comes up. And then how about this one in Daniel? Time, times and half a time. We see that come up. You've all read it. You've seen these things, right? And then the term 42 months. I'm thinking, why are all these different, these different uh, calculations being used? I said, well, let me, I'll make a table. And I think you can see that. There are nine references on here. From Daniel to Revelation to Luke, and, and Luke and James are an interesting one. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But you can see the number of times that the number 1260 is used. Time, times, and half a time is used by Daniel in those two uh, verses there. And 42 months gets used twice as well. They all figure out to one thing, a three and a half year time frame. And every one of them is based on a 30 day month. All through the scripture. Now here's an interesting de detail. We've all read about the story of Elijah being in the cave and he's being fed by the birds and all this kind of stuff. I thought over the years, it was three and a half years he was in the cave. How many of you heard that? Three and a half years, right? Yeah. It's not in 1 Kings 18 or 17 and 18. It's not there at all. In fact, what's interesting is the reference to Elijah is these years. And then there's another one that says in the third year. But it never says Elijah's tied into anything dealing with three and a half years. But the scripture does say that he was tied into a three and a half year period. And it comes in Luke 4.25 and James 5.17. Now where they got Elijah hanging out for three and a half years in the cave, I don't know. But it's in the scripture and it tells you exactly what was going on. So the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures are silent, but the New Testament writers shed a little bit of light on it. Fascinating. So when you look at this distribution, one of the conclusions you have to make is a 30 day prophetic month exists and there's the, ev there's the evidence for it, right? As I mentioned, Daniel, you can see, well, you can see where the distributions are there. In the Revelation piece is two witnesses we believe to be Moses, oftentimes Elijah, could be Enoch. There's a, there's a, a frame of thinking that might be Enoch. Um, will prophesy for 1260 days, again, a three and a half year period. We know that the tribulation period or the 70th week of Daniel, broken up into two halves, two three and a half year periods, it isn't real clear if they're in the first or second half, but there certainly is a three and a half year time period that is associated with them. In Revelation 12, 6, the woman who flees into the wilderness, we believe to be Israel, looking for help and uh, protection, she's um, nourished for 1260 days. And again, she shows up in Revelation 12, 14, where she's nourished for a time, times and half a time. Again, a three and a half year period. Fascinating details, isn't it? And it's consistent throughout the scripture. So let's take a look now at that decree, Nehemiah's decree. In chapter two, verse one through three, early the following spring in the month of Nisan, interestingly enough, the month of Nisan, a critical month for prophecy. During the 20th year of King Artaxerxes reign, I was serving the king his wine. Ah, Nehemiah was a sommelier. He could tell you the difference between a good Riesling and a good Cabernet. That's an important skill. I'm just a screw top guy. I don't get into all that. Yeah, it's... I had never before been sad in his presence. Third sad. Nehemiah was depressed. We are humans and we have emotions. He recorded his depression. So if you ever hear people, oh, don't be sad, don't be depressed. We are humans and it happens. And Nehemiah put it right there in the scripture. In verse two, so the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me, you must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified. But I replied, long live the king. That was the thing that you said if you wanted to keep your head on your shoulders. Long live the king, how can I not be sad for the city 
where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Everything that Nehemiah knew, or Nehemiah as his Hebrew name is, everything that he knew was destroyed. Now he was, you know, he had probably been one of the captives. He'd been living a long time out of the, out of the land. Let's look a little bit more further into this decree. The king asked, well, how can I help you? This is a good king with a prayer to the, the God of heaven. Nehemiah replies, if it pleases the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. And this turns into the decree that fits the model of the 70 weeks. This turns into the decree that fits the model of the 70 weeks. Jeremiah is depressed, but he hears something good from the king. Where, is his, where, where does he go now with his emotions? He gains hope. He gains hope that they're going to be able to rebuild and he's going to have a chance to go home. I don't know about you, but I cannot live without hope in my life. I can't. Because once hope is gone, there's no reason to live. I hope that you have hope in your lives. I hope that you understand that hope is something that we will look forward to in the future. Nehemiah's request is, re- is accepted, and then let's, let's see how this closes out. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I'd be gone, the king agreed to my request. And in verse 7, I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And in verse 8, and please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest. Why would you be worried about the guy that runs a forest? He's going to be the ones that are going to provide you with the wood to be able to cut and then build what you need. Instructing him to give me timber, I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. Nehemiah is looking forward to the restoration of Israel in his time. Nehemiah now has hope, which is what this entire block of text is giving us. Yeshua's arrival in the future for us is hope. His arrival back in Nehemiah's time wasn't even on the radar unless you were reading and you knew that there was going to be a moment where God would rise. That gives all of us an opportunity for hope. Now, 490, the number 490. 70 times 7. We know, and we're going to look at a couple of verses here to give us some of the, of the context, why we're even here doing Daniel. Let's start out with uh, 2 Chronicles 36. This is a very quick uh, review. He took into exile those who had escaped from the, the sword from Babylon, and they were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, speaking, of course, of the Babylonian captivity. And in verse 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. In other words, for 490 years, Israel did not keep the Sabbath year. Leviticus 25 and 26 cover all of that. So God basically said, I'm taking 70 years of that and I'm sending you into captivity. So the land was able to rest for 70 years. The land was able to rest for 70 years to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days of desolation had kept the Sabbath until 70 years were complete. And there's the reference there. So I was just thinking... Have you ever anticipated a big event in your life? A vacation, a family reunion, graduation, a job offer maybe, or even the birth of a child? Anticipation, looking forward to the future is an exciting time. It's a time of hope. The anticipation of good things after such a long period of time is one of the greatest examples of hope. It's what we need to get through our lives. Now, Where does this 490-year period come from? Again, Sir Robert Anderson in The Coming Prince 
gave us an incredible graphic. You can't really see the detail, but let me explain it in the bullets there. Three major eras of 70 weeks or 490 years in Israel's history. And he, if you look at, there's a timeline on the bottom, then you've got a series of things that have happened in Israel's history. The first major period breakdown there is from Canaan to the kingdom, roughly 1600 BC to 1100 BC. The second one is the era of the prophets from 1100 BC or BCE, I should say, to about 450 BCE. And the, myst the mystic area of the 70 weeks will come in Daniel 9.25. In other words, 490 was a repeating cycle in Israel's history. Does God deliver on the details? He delivers on the details. So this 490 year period that we're coming into in Daniel 9 is the last of these periods of 490 years. I looked at this and I went, this guy was writing in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. He didn't have computers. He didn't have any electronics. He was doing all of this by hand. Fascinating, fascinating time. So the caveat in the second segment there in the middle deals with Israel being out of God's will and under control of foreign entities. When you read the judges, you know, for a while they were obedient, then they weren't, and then they were. When you're under control of a foreign entity, you lose hope. When the deliverer comes, the Samsons and the other, the other judges that came, you gain hope. So it's a cycle, right? It goes up and down, just like our lives, nothing different. 490 years plays a significant role in Israel's history. And remember, Leviticus 25 and 26 speak of the importance of the sabbatical year. So that is underlying all of this, these periods of time um, to let the land rest, and then giving us these cycles. We have hope in Messiah for the forgiveness of our sins. And that's really where we're going with all this. All of this instability, because we are human, will eventually come to a conclusion. Let's take a look and see what that looks like. Matthew 18. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as 70 times. Or as many as seven times. Yeshua says to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. 70 times seven. From Romans 8, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. Or who hopes for what he already sees? If you already have it in front of you, there's no hope. We have hope of something we don't see. Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, through perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. When all is said and done, it is the hope we have in Messiah. Daniel received a prophecy that he would never see, but he remained hopeful that God would finish the work that he had begun. Daniel was delivered several times in, his, in, his, in the story we have, of course, or Daniel being delivered from the lion's den, and his friends, of course, being delivered from the furnace. Daniel had hardcore personal experience of God's hand in his life, in his deliverance. Daniel was delivered, and in the book, he continues to grow as a character. This is... Hope rooted in forgiveness. Hope rooted in forgiveness. So the central truth. Gabriel delivers the 70 weeks prophecy to Daniel and in so doing sets up the final stage of his age. 70 weeks of seven years or 490 years. We looked at the first 483. We'll examine the next one next week. These numbers are worth counting. Albert Einstein told us, not everything that can be counted counts, but there are certain things that are, and this is one of them. Knowing that Yeshua has accomplished the first half of his mission gives us hope. He is coming back to finish his work. And that is where we have our hope. When all is said and done, there is an element of forgiveness here that we are to forgive 490 times as Yeshua instructed Peter. 70 times seven. Forgiveness is what we do and who we are. Our congregational verses, the, the people are gonna know, Ben David, by the love we show for one another. 
we are patient and we are kind with one another. We forgive when we are hurt over and over and over again. That is our job because that's how we reflect the king's life in, in, our, in our lives. <clears throat> As we are forgiven, we are to forgive. Let's pray. Father, I, you are our redeemer, our Lord. You are our savior. You are our hope because you forgive us of our sins. There will be a time, Lord, where sin will be completely done away with. And you will give us, Lord, that, that confidence knowing that you are indeed at work in our lives. Help us, Lord, to remember this every day, to forgive one another as you forgive us. We have hope, Lord, only in you, in Yeshua's name.